already I've got 256. <laughs> um, Alistair, what's happening in your world? How is the weather? How are things there? Maybe share a little bit about how one or two things in terms of the experience of a dental practitioners there. Okay, Casey, it's good to see you. I was kind of beginning to suffer from Casey withdrawal symptoms because I just hadn't seen for so long and I hadn't laughed with her for so long. But yeah, things are good in the UK. You know, we've been really efficient with our vaccines. Last night, we got the news that this was the first, yesterday was the first day where there were zero COVID deaths in the oh, UK. Wow. So it's fantastic news and we are heading back to a kind of new normal. Um, we can't travel anywhere. I, you know, when we did the roadshow last year, um, you know, we were only kind of two or three months into the pandemic and we thought, well, it will be over quite soon. But here we are a year later and I haven't been anywhere near our offices. And I guess you guys are the same as well. So uh, no traveling, um, no plans to come down to South Africa this year. I don't think it will happen for us this year, but really looking forward to seeing everybody face to face next year. My only regret, this was going to be a big year. This, is, uh, this was a big birthday year for me, Casey. And I'd always planned to make sure I was in South Africa to follow uh, the British Lions rugby tour playing the Springboks. So it's a huge regret that I'm not going to get to do that. And I was going to go to some of the games with some of my friends down there. So I'm sorry about that, but I still know that the games are going ahead and I hope it's a really good series. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. You know what? I know that we've got quite a lot to go through today. It's already seven o'clock. Um, I would like to greet all of the 570 so far that have joined us. Um, and um, what I'm going to be talking about now, obviously, is things that we have done before. I would like to welcome our speakers. We're going to hear about and from them just now. But I just want to remind everyone, my name is Casey Makuwila. I'm the CEO of the South African Dental Association. That's in case there is one or two people that does not know who I am. And if you don't know who I am, it may be that you are not a member of SADA. And if you're not a member of SADA, um, please send me a message by email at kcmakubele at sada.co.za or ceo at sada.co.za and explain why you're not a member. Um, so that's critical. <laughs> that is the announcement from the president. <laughs> um, guys, quickly, those who are here, we are now 630. Um, um, please refrain from using a raised uh, hand, but type your comments and questions on the Q&A tab. We'll deal with those questions after all three speakers have spoken. Uh, your CPD certificates will be loaded to the SADA platform and you will be able to access all your certificates under your membership profile. So all the other certificates that have, have you, 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 you have attended uh, CPD points are available and you can load. Just allow me to also say, uh, I'm aware of the email that is circulating with regards to uploading your, your, your CPD in the HPCSA platform. We will be um, clarifying that for everyone. The good thing is that our uh, system is built in a way that should articulate to the HPCSA. And we hope that actually we should be able to do that on your behalf if you are a member of the association. The event tonight qualifies for once uh, uh, CEU points, and um, we are streaming live on YouTube. Also, in case you have difficulty to access the Zoom platform, but we would prefer that you're on the Zoom. Um, those who are on the Zoom platform, you do not need to do anything further. You will get your certificate. But for those of you that are watching from YouTube for whatever reason, then, and if you want a certificate, we'll have to write a, a, a test on this particular um, um, particular uh, webinar. Please, uh, um, in terms of the next uh, available uh, uh, webinars on the 12th of May, SADA National Reception Day, uh, it's called In Charge of the Practice Remote Control with Seni Baloi as well as Ms. Delian Slabert. Please attend that and try and get your reception to be part of this. On the 18th of May, SADA KZN branch, they will be dealing with power power uh, therapies for the South African dentist. And this will be with Dr. Ibrahim, Ibrahim Patel. So yes, thank you so much. It's good to see all of you. I uh, would like to start immediately 
um, and welcome from me. I'm so excited to have you here. This is always one of the best uh, webinars that we look forward to. And I know that we get a lot of questions. By the way, um, you guys are the top speakers. Already I'm sitting at 720 of attendees, Aliza. I think it's because of me. If I didn't come, if I was not sharing this, I don't think it will be there. I'm the center of attraction. <laughs> you, you, you are, Casey, and, and what an introduction. I mean, I think you need to go and lie down for five minutes to catch your breath. Amazing. It's, it's great to be part of, of this evening. Are you happy for me just to get proceedings underway, Casey? <laughs> 100%, 100%, 100%. Thank you okay. so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you for, for the introduction. Good evening, everybody in South Africa. I think I'm the only person, uh, well, maybe not the only person in the Northern Hemisphere, but um, I was just saying to Casey that, it, that last year we did the roadshow on a digital platform. We were only two or three months into the pandemic, and here we are a year later doing exactly the same again. But we've got a magnificent turnout tonight, and I just want to say hello to all of my friends, colleagues, and members of Dental Protection in South Africa, it's good to be with you again, and I look forward to being with you face-to-face -face sometime in 2022. So the title of my talk tonight is So You Think You've Been Unlucky Then, and the reason for that title will become clear in a moment or two. The, the most frequently requested webinar topic we get is for us to talk about using our cases, our cases history, our cases experience to deliver a risk management message or story. So tonight I'm gonna to talk about a few interesting cases highlighting danger. Sometimes we fail to spot the danger and in other cases we can't seem to avoid danger as dentists. And these are cases involving South African dentists and some of them might be on the webinar tonight. So I recognize that there's a tension between protecting the confidentiality of the individual dentist, which I've done in all of these cases, and taking into consideration the wider interests of the group tonight to learn from the experiences of those colleagues. Some of the dentists in the cases have been incredibly unlucky, and some have been the author of their own misfortune. In all of the cases we have picked, our member up, we've dusted them down, and we've helped them find the right outcome when the way forward was obscured by emotion, by fear, by pride, or just an inability to see the correct solution. So the first case we're going to look at tonight is an endodontic case. And let's talk about what happened here. Well, Tooth 15 needed a retreatment three months after this root filling was provided. And the patient was unhappy about this and wrote to the dentist. And the patient said, please, will you pay for the treatment? I've been advised it is necessary. And will you also refund me what you charged me for this failed treatment three months ago? Now, let's be honest, it's not the best root canal treatment we've seen. And it's probably no surprise things didn't settle down. So what did the dentist say about being asked to pay the money for the retreatment? and to refund what the dentist had charged in the first place. Well, the dentist said to me, I charged her a reduced cash rate, so I'm happy to pay her back this amount since she wasn't happy with the root treatment. But I find it grossly unfair to be held responsible for the other dentist's account. So is she right or is she wrong? Is she unlucky? Well, let's have a look at this. So part of my job is to look at the fine details. And when we looked at the records, there were two key opportunities that I identified that created an additional problem apart from just the treatment. So the first problem happens on the 9th of October when the dentist realizes the root treatment is deficient and informs the patient the root filling is short. The subsequent sequence of events where the tooth becomes painful is highly predictable and a retreatment should have been discussed and arranged immediately. The root canal treatment is well short of where it needs to be. And if the dentist was unable to improve the outcome, then the patient would need to have been referred to another colleague. So at this point, we accept the root filling is of a poor standard, but the situation is recoverable with an open and candid discussion with your patient. 
it's simply not enough to say the root treatment is short. This patient needs to understand that more work is needed and the consequences of doing nothing for there to be a defense. Now, the patient informed about a short root filling is simply not enough information. The second opportunity missed to contain the problem happens on the 21st of October when the patient returns in pain. The infection hasn't returned, it never went away, and antibiotics was the wrong treatment again, and a second opportunity to discuss the absolute need for a retreatment was missed. So what does this all add to up to in RAND? Well, what loss has this dentist actually caused? What compensation could the patient recover if she went to an attorney? Well, the first thing is the poor root treatment has caused the need for a repeat procedure, and this has a cost because the patient wasn't given the correct information about the impact of the poor root fillings, she was denied the opportunity to choose to have something done immediately. Had she been fully informed, it's more likely than not based upon her behavior that she would have had the retreatment done sooner and the pain and the antibiotic treatment of the 21st of October would have been avoided. This also has a cost. The cost of obtaining a second and a third opinion would not have been necessary had the root canal treatment been completed correctly in the first place. And the pain and inconvenience of having the work redone has a financial monetary value as well. So when we add it all up, it far exceeds what the dentist was being asked to pay. So how did dental protection help? Well, first we stopped the dentist following one bad decision with another. We explained why the dentist's understanding was incorrect, and we recognized the opportunity to turn a potential 250,000 Rand claim into a simple refund was there. And this is what we mean at Dental Protection when we talk about exercising discretion. If you are with an insurer, you are required to report this type of incident, but most insurers cannot respond until the patient issues a letter of demand or a combined summons via the lawyer. Most insurers don't have the flexibility and the contextual clinical knowledge to recognize the opportunity that we took here. The patient just wants someone to give her a refund and pay for the remedial treatment. It's the right thing to do. And because there was factual evidence of poor treatment, we were able to assist our member proactively, give the correct advice and help financially to do the right thing. So the next case I want to talk about is an implant case. And Dr. A was asked to remove the lower right second premolar tooth four five and place two implants in the edentulous space where four five and four six were missing. For some reason, the patient was really unhappy with the way the implants were placed. And I think there was a disagreement over the use of an antibiotic that the patient said they were allergic to. So the patient had probably made up his mind at that point that he was gonna go after Dr. A if any of the treatment was, went wrong. Now, Dr. A was retiring shortly after he placed the implants and he transferred the confirmation of integration to another specialist colleague. And the long and short of it was that these implants were signed off as fully integrated and ready to be restored. So the dentist responsible for the planning and restoration of both implants had some difficulties restoring both implants. Now, I'm not an expert here, but the contour, the contact points, and the absence of a restoration in the root filled 4-7 seemed to be contributing to the main complaint, which was food packing and difficulty maintaining good oral hygiene. The bone loss and the peri-implantitis seems to have happened following the placement of restorations. And we've reached a point here where professional opinion suggests the loss of 4-6 is inevitable. So what happened next? And remember, we had an independent specialist confirming both implants were properly integrated and ready for restoration. Well, Dr. A had a complaint made to the SADA mediator. He also had a complaint made to the HPCSA, and he also had to face a claim for damages. And on the balance of probability, all the evidence we have here points to a peri-implant problem during and after the placement of the restorations. 
How did this happen? We don't know, but there are a number of questions that we would be asking. Why wasn't the 47 properly restored? How much planning was involved here? We just don't know those answers because the lens of blame has never been on the restoring dentist in this case, only on the guy who placed the implants. He did what he was asked to do, all very reasonable and subject to independent scrutiny. Yet Dr. A faced three separate investigations where on each occasion we presented a logical analysis of the case and concluded it was illogical to blame Dr. A for the loss of 4-6. Mediation failed because it needs both parties to agree. The HPCSA found no evidence of unprofessional conduct or clinical incompetence to uphold the complaint. And we have denied negligence on the behalf of Dr. A in the claim and are prepared to him as far as we need to go to clear his name. So what can we learn from this case? Well, some dentists are just really unlucky and just end up with a crusader of a patient as happened here. The bit that I find hard to believe is that nobody's actually told the patient the most likely cause of his peri-implant disease are actually the restorations. Now, Dr. A retired from clinical practice just after the implants were placed, and that was over four years ago. When we advised him a few weeks ago that all of the cases were settled and the problem was over, this is what he said to us. He said, I don't know how some of our colleagues can practice without having membership of dental protection. I've needed you on a few occasions and you've stood by me and we've been successful in both those cases. The stress involved, however, is something one does not want to ever go through again. Don't underestimate the human collateral damage when a patient is convinced you've harmed them, when everybody can see it's not your fault. This guy has just been incredibly unlucky and it's been a privilege to support him. So case number three I want to talk about involves antibiotics and particularly when an antibiotic might not be the best choice of treatment. So in this case, we've got a patient that presents to the dentist with pain. Tooth 17 is heavily restored with composite, the tooth sensitive to percussion. There's thermal sensitivity, pain and chewing, a periapical x-ray is taken, and the dentist makes a diagnosis of either acute pulpitis or a structural failure of the tooth with a pulpitis overlaying that. Now, the patient was slightly awkward here because the patient was adamant that she didn't want an extraction and at the time couldn't commit to paying for the root canal treatment. Now, the dentist was running late, didn't have the composure and the clear thinking to manage a difficult situation and prescribed some antibiotics. The antibiotics met the patient's needs and got the patient out of the treatment room but that wasn't the end of the problem because the patient developed a drug-induced vasculitis. There was no history of antibiotic allergy or sensitivity. The patient was admitted to hospital. She had IV cortisone and six months of acethioprine imurin and then came back and said, the dentist must pay all my medical bills. Now, is the dentist responsible for paying those bills? Well, yes, the dentist is more likely than not to be the cause of the problem. And it's not the, the dentist's fault that the patient had a very rare reaction to the antibiotics. That's bad luck. But the problem is the patient only has to prove that there was no clinical indication for the use of an antibiotic and that that dosage to be entitled to have her medical bills. Had the pulpitis been managed correctly, an antibiotic would probably not have been, prescri been prescribed. There was no evidence of infection, there was no evidence of a necrotic pulp, and we all know that antibiotics is not the correct treatment of an inflamed pulp unless it is non-vital. So what can we learn from this? Well, patient-led treatment is really, really dangerous, and there are some times that you've got to be prepared to say no, even if what you're being asked to do is not clinically justifiable, even in an emergency and prescribing medication where there's no clinical basis cannot be in the patient's best interest and could amount to negligence. So part two is again another antibiotic story. And this patient was referred to our member for the extraction of 2.6 and 3.8. 
because the member was a visiting surgeon, he didn't see the patient pre-op, the patient turned up for the extractions, the teeth were removed very easily without any trouble. But two days later, the patient comes back to see the dentist with a swelling at the angle of her mandible. She developed an infection and our dentist thought she had been on antibiotics prophylactically when she wasn't. There was some sort of misunderstanding or miscommunication about uh, who was prescribing antibiotics because it had been the usual protocol that the referring dentist would put the patient on antibiotics. So the antibiotics were actually started two days after the swelling started. Things went from bad to worse. The infection didn't respond to the antibiotics and the patient found herself being admitted with a potentially serious swelling on her way to perhaps a life-threatening Ludwig's angina. So surgical drainage was needed, eventually recovered, everything was okay, but the patient was unhappy. She had to pay additional hospital fees she couldn't afford. She felt there was somebody to blame for this. She presumed the infection would have been, present, would have been prevented had she been given prophylactic antibiotics and she knew the dentist had intended her to be on antibiotics. So have the dentists been negligent or have both been unlucky? Well, this is the big question. Our member certainly felt a misunderstanding had taken place and that had effective communication taken place, then the patient would have been given antibiotics before the extraction and the infection probably wouldn't have arisen. And when we're looking to defend a dentist, what we need to do is we need to first identify what the professional standard is. What would a reasonable dentist have done in that situation? Where is the evidence? Can you justify what you did or didn't do? Or is this just a rare non-negligent complication of an extraction? Well, the reality here is that both the patient and the dentist have been unlucky. Scientific evidence informs teaching and underpins what we do clinically. Now, there was a piece of research by Prof Morkel that concluded that the use of prophylactic antibiotics did not have a statistically significant effect on post-op infections in third molar surgery. This was the get out of jail free card for our dentists. The authors recommend that the use of antibiotics should not be administered routinely when third molars are removed in non-immune compromised patients. And sometimes we end up doing things for our own self-serving reasons. Sometimes it's just because we can't seem to think of anything else to do. And it's a form of defensive dentistry to reach for the antibiotics. You almost justify it to yourself by saying, at least I'm doing something. But in both antibiotic cases, the management of antibiotics was incorrect. It wasn't because the dentists were knowingly wrong or blameworthy. It's just that they'd forgotten what they'd been taught and fallen into the trap of using antibiotics when they probably weren't clinically indicated. So in the first case, we ended up paying compensation to the patient who was hospitalized for six months. The second patient, we argued that there was no scientific basis to support the use of prophylactic antibiotics despite what was discussed and that the patient had in fact received a proper and reasonable standard of care and her infection was down to butt luck or bad luck rather than by an error by her dentist, even though at the time he thought it was. So antibiotic key learning points, when you prescribe antibiotics, make sure you can justify what you're doing based on sound clinical indicators. Do not prescribe when the evidence won't justify and always remember that attorneys can exploit poor antibiotic stewardship. So the second last case is about a difficult extraction. And what happened here is that the patient is referred by Dr. A to Dr. B for urgent extraction of this tooth under local anesthetic. Dr. B, the patient is booked in to see Dr. B for the extraction, but when Dr. B looks at the internal referral, he decides that it would probably be a good idea if this extraction is carried out under sedation. So rather than have a conversation with the patient, the receptionist is told to contact the patient, advising her that sedation was needed and to therefore contact the anaesthetist for a quote. 
So the patient contacts the anaesthetist and requests a discount on the quoted fees. There then follows a disagreement between the anaesthetist and the patient on the level of discount. And there's a bit of a fallout. And the anaesthetist receptionist decides that she's been, the patient's been very rude to her, very challenging. And the anaesthetist takes the decision that he's not doesn't find this behaviour by the patient acceptable and says he's no longer doing the sedation. That decision is reported back to the dental practice and it's reported to, to dentist B who is going to do the extraction. And he also instructs his staff to tell, call the patient and advise that he was withdrawing his services as well. The patient then finds another dentist who's willing to see her, who removes the tooth very easily without sedation and saves five and a half thousand rand. There then is a formal complaint lodged with both the anaesthetist and the dentist, accusing them of a number of ethical violations. The first one being that the actions of both the dentist and the anaesthetist brought the business into disrepute. They were criticised for refusing to undertake an urgent procedure, which was described as unethical. And the difference between 6,200 Rand and 778 is alarming and smacks of insider training. She wasn't finished there because she said that because they both work in an affluent suburb, doesn't give greedy doctors the right to fleece local residents, particularly during a pandemic where people are financially compromised. And she said, if you don't provide me with a reasonable response, then it's off to the HPCSA for both of you. So have dentists been, the anaesthetist been unlucky? The anaesthetist is unlucky here because all of this could have been avoided if dentist B had taken the time to discuss the need for sedation directly with the patient. He then could have introduced the option of conscious sedation, talked about the benefits to the patient. And in fact, what we heard from dentist B that that he had decided on a treatment plan, quoted the, the patient as to what he deemed to be the correct procedure. And it's, the problem here is that the patient wasn't part of that decision. The patient wasn't given the opportunity to understand why the procedure would be a lot easier with sedation. And for consent to be informed and valid, we all know a patient must participate in the discussion and make the choice about sedation. And the fact that this had not been raised in her complaint was only a matter of time. And we suspected the HPCSA would view the conduct as paternalistic and possibly out of touch with contemporary legal and ethical standards for consent. So how did we help here? Well, nobody had really identified that the failure to discuss the need for sedation was at the heart of the problem. So the first thing we did was we gathered together all, the, all, all of the information. We took the focus away from the rudeness of the patient and we helped both doctors understand that the failure to involve the patient in a decision about her care was at the heart of the problem. And once we had buy into the problem, we had a plan where Dr. B would write a letter to the patient apologizing for a series of events which arose from a lack of information and poor decision-making in his part. The letter addressed the error of not involving the patient in the decision about sedation, and then for siding with the anaesthetist and saying she was no longer welcome at the practice for being rude. That was really the wrong thing to do. And Dr. B should have at least explained what other options there were available to the patient, including just carrying out the extraction with a local anaesthetic. And it was this lack of information that created the opportunity for a fallout with the anaesthetist with the anaesthetist. The letter closed with an apology and an admission. And this is what Dentist B said in, clo in closing, I can only apologize. I got it wrong and you should not be accountable for asserting your rights. It was me who put you in that position by my poor decision-making. And the explanation, the apology and the accountability stopped an HPCSA complaint in its tracks for both doctors. The allegations were withdrawn and we moved from a confrontational response from the patient to a position where she concludes her complaint. Thank you for your honest and sincere email expressing your apology. It's appreciated and has renewed our faith in doctors. We are pleased that this episode has created more mindfulness in your medical environment, that patients need to be fully informed of procedures and reasons for costs. Don't be afraid 
of saying I'm sorry. Don't be afraid of taking responsibility. It's not an admission of guilt. It's not an admission of negligence. It is sometimes all that's required to conclude a really difficult complaint. So the last case I want to talk about is the fractured endodontic file. And this file that you can see in the lower molar here, separated during an endodontic procedure in 2011. The patient was age 14 at the time. The crown was fitted to the, to the tooth at a later date, which potentially raises a different issue about who's responsible for paying for a new crown. But the question that arises here is whether the dentist should be responsible for paying for the retreatment that the family now consider is necessary in 2021. Now, what we were able to establish here was that there might have been a conversation with the mother, but there was no record of it. The dentist told us she remembered advising the mother of the file fracture and advising her to bring the patient back if there was a problem. So 10 years later, our member is asked to pay for the remedial treatment and we've no defense if the correct conversation didn't happen, which is what this family are saying. In fact, they said this is all news to us. And then the family, if they say that, will rightly say that they were denied the opportunity to have the problem fixed earlier because they didn't know there was a problem that needed to be fixed. So even if we could argue there was no negligence attached to the fracture of the file, there was negligence with the way the information about the fracture file was communicated to the patient. In such a scenario, the family are going to argue successfully that the file procedure, if it happened 10 years ago, would have been much cheaper than it is now, and that the child would also not to have suffered the pain and inconvenience of the intermittent sepsis that must have taken place as the root filling failed. In financial terms, the cost of the two points above exceed what the file recovery will now cost, and we need to be aware of this. So we agreed to assist our member financially to help her pay for the remedial treatment. We don't, we don't want to engage directly with the patient here if the refund can be managed by the dentist. It looks better. It, lo it looks better if the dentist is seen to be fixing the problem. And if the attorneys are not involved, then we can involve avoid another expensive claim. So with files, there are three areas of focus. If you want to say that it's a recognized complication, then you're going to have to make sure that the patient is warned beforehand. And I think the key here is to make sure they know that file retrieval is an expense they will need to fund themselves if it happens. And this is a really difficult conversation because it introduces doubt, risk, and cost and some patients will not like the negativity around the treatment. If paying additional fees is going to be an issue for the patient, then the discussion has to take place. And it's all about knowing your patients and being upfront with them. Just be confident. We then need to make sure we can show that we manage the files correctly. Can we say a file fracture is a non-negligent complication? I don't know. Is file fracture always due to poor file handling? I don't know. Do the guys who limit their practice to endo have file fractures or not? I don't know. But if I'm the patient's attorney, I'm looking at file management. And if you're going to be challenged about this, you need to be able to say that you always dispose of single use files. You need to be able to demonstrate that you follow correct file protocols, that you cut reasonable, reasonably successful access cavities in the tooth, and you need to have some sort of written policy that helps you track the recycling of endodontic instruments so that they're not overused and become more susceptible to fracture. And then when it all happens, you've got to advise the patient it's happened. Tell them what options are available right there and then and what you would recommend. Tell them what could happen if the file is not removed. Discuss with them who's going to pay for this. It might be the patient. It might be that you do not charge your own fee. It might be that you decide to make a contribution towards the patient's cost of retrieving the file. If it's non-negligent, then you can't expect the indemnifier, the insurer, to pay the cost of a retreatment. We cannot underwrite the cost of every file fracture. But if you need advice on how to proceed with the patient where a file has fractured, please get in contact with us. So that brings me to uh, the, the end of my presentation, and I'm going to stop sharing now. I'm also going to 
uh, invite my colleague, Dr. Yash Naidu, to take over and not only to introduce himself, but to talk about what's happening on the 1st of July and try and provide you with a very simple guide to the things that you'll need to comply with once the Poppy Act is fully enacted. So, Yash. Thank, uh, thanks, thanks, over. Alistair. I'm, I'm sure you can see my, my slide there on the screen. Just let me know for confirmation. I yes. can. Yep. Perfect, perfect. So thanks, thanks, Alistair. And, and, and Casey, thanks very much. You know, it's good to be back again. Um, the last time we spoke was six months ago, I think, when I chatted about clinical mentoring via social media. So this time, Alistair approached me and said to me, yes, you need to do a presentation on Poppy, but it mustn't be on sections and acts and regulations, but, but more a simple explainer on working with Poppy. <laughs> and I thought to myself, geez, you know, Alistair, there's a reason why these popular TV shows like Suits and, and Law and Order don't give you a look into the lives of uh, compliance and regulatory lawyers. You know, it's not exactly the most glamorous type of work. And I know they won't be offended, the regulatory lawyers, because it's their joke. But I thought about it and I said, look, there are plenty of webinars out there recently which go into quite a bit of detail. That's the acts and regulations and sections that Alistair was alluding to. I, I mean, you can go onto YouTube now and type in Poppy or Poppia, uh, which by the way, that's the acronym which I see most of the big law firms have now settled on, uh, Poppia or Papaya. I'm not sure exactly the pronunciation. Personally, I prefer Papaya because it uh, reminds me of an exotic fruit, but I'll be interchanging as we go. So anyway, if you go on the internet, you'll find many of these webinars by the big law firms and Dental protection members will have attended our webinars uh, recently in which we've given um, some of our panel lawyers an opportunity to speak to you in detail on this. Actually, I think in August and September last year, we had a two-part series for two hours on the subject. So there's lots of content out there. And I said to Alistair, look, I'll try my best not to make them fall asleep. And I thought, you know, in order for me to even try to do that, I'm probably going to have to take a slightly different approach. Now, I think it's safe to say that those of you in attendance tonight, uh, you know, well, those of you that actually are at your screens and haven't just switched your computers on and left it in the background, most of you are the types of dentists that personally I would want if I was a patient, because, you know, you keep yourselves updated with the latest clinical and ethical guidelines by attending these types of events. So I'm pretty sure you all would have at least heard about Papia before. So I'm just going to give it a basic introduction in my next slide. And perhaps this is mainly just for the benefit of those who've never heard about it before. So there's mainly one reason actually why I flooded this slide with all this information. And that's simply to make Alistair nervous and think, oh my word, Yash has gone and done exactly what I've asked him not to do. So, you know, just, I'm really not going to make you go through everything that's on this slide. I promised I'd give you the basics or the need to know bits as an introduction to Papia. So Alistair, don't worry, I've kept to the brief. But all I'm going to say, and really I think all you need to know is that Papia stands for the Protection of Personal Information Act. And it's not there to stop you from processing or dealing with your patient's personal information. Its purpose is simply to tell you how to do it properly. So just a fun fact, what you see on your screen right now is called the long title of the act. Uh, Protection of Personal Information Act is the short title. And, and as I say this, I realize it's probably not a fun fact, but this is a fact nonetheless. So all acts in South Africa have short titles, which is what we generally know them by. So for example, the National Health Act and the Health Professions Act, these are actually short titles of those acts. But in the act, just underneath the short title is what we call a long title, which is meant to give more information about the act and help with its interpretation. So this on your screen is a long title of Papia. And if you've managed to read it while I've been speaking, I'm sure you'll have gotten a better idea of what the actual purpose is of the act. And some of you might be thinking, well, Yash, what's so special about this particular act? And why is it, as you said, there's so much recent information about it on the internet? And the reason is it's, it's a relatively new act. So it's been around since about the end of 2014, and I know that sounds old, but it only became actually effective uh, for the most part 
on the 1st of July last year. And even then it had more of a bark than a bite because we were all given a one year grace period within which to comply. And, and that one year ends on the 30th of June, 2021. So by July this year, we need to be compliant with the act. And that's why recently the lawyers, bless them, they've been raising awareness around the act. I mean, you can imagine that big organizations who need advice and assistance with PR compliance will definitely benefit from this kind of awareness. And who knows, you know, maybe even provide some nice stream of work for the lawyers. That's only a half joke. But whatever the motive, you know, the important thing is that Popia will grow teeth, so to speak, as of the 1st of July. And that's why it's a bit of a hot topic recently. So this is where I'm going to take the slightly different approach and not go with the acts and the regulations and the sections, but rather just try to make this more practical and digestible and relevant to us as dentists. So I'll be talking about these three main ideas on your screen tonight. The first point is, is what is personal information and why does it matter? You know, when we sit in these Papia webinars and the lawyers take us through all the provisions and the implications of the new act, it's quite easy to understand why the bigger picture can be missed out. And you can't blame the lawyers. I, I don't blame them. It's, it's because the act is so new. You know, there haven't really been any court cases dealing with it, although this will change soon, I think. And actually, there was a recent judgment coming out of Cape Town um, in which the High Court dealt with Papia in the context of litigation and disclosure of medical records when somebody was suing um, a couple of institutions for damages. But that's another story for another day. And so back to my point, the act is so new that for the lawyers, at least, I think it's almost impossible for them not to deal with the various different sections and the cold, hard law. And I think they would be remiss in not dealing with it in that way. And you know, there's plenty of material on that, as I said, and I really urge you, you know, particularly if you're a dental protection member, go have a look at that two-part series for all the detail. But I really want us to take a step back this evening and ask, why does it matter? Why is the legislature taking this so seriously? You know, why is Europe so stiff with its GDPR, which is the equivalent of poppy? And to answer that, we need to look at the type of personal information that we as dentists are entrusted to handle. Then the next question I'll discuss is, does this change everything? And spoiler alert, the answer is no. And then lastly, we'll deal with the practical way in which it's been suggested that consent may be obtained as far as processing of personal information by dentists is concerned. So the first issue I said we talk about um, is what is personal information and why does it matter? So that's a two part question. And I'll answer the first part simply by looking at what Papia says personal information is. I'll make it really simple. Papia's definition of personal information is so broad that it covers virtually any information you process about your patients. So it includes things like the obvious things like physical addresses, telephone numbers, location information. It's got race, sex, gender, pregnancy, marital status, sexual orientation, disability, language, all of this also counts as personal information. Even the personal opinions and views and preferences of your patient is their personal information per Poppy's definition. But even further than that, the views or opinions of another person about your patient is included in the definition of personal information. Then we've got correspondence sent by the person implicitly or explicitly of a confidential nature. That's also personal information. So the patient doesn't necessarily have to say in their email to you, hi, hi, Dr. Naidu, you know, this is confidential. If it's treatment related, it is confidential. Another thing that qualifies as personal information is the name of the person, if it appears with other personal information relating to the person, or if the disclosure of the name itself would reveal information about that person. And this is important in a dental practice context because simply by revealing a patient's name to the public, you're potentially processing their personal information because disclosing the name of that person would reveal to the public that that person is a patient. But let's be honest, I don't think any of us doubts that we keep personal information about our patients. I don't think that's a contentious point. 
And this is where I then come to the distinction which Poppy draws between personal information and special personal information. So healthcare providers, that's us obviously as dentists, we're privileged in the sense that we're entrusted to deal with health information about our patients. And this is special personal information among with the others that you'll see um, listed on the table on the right of your screen. And it's special because not just anybody is allowed to handle special personal information. In fact, Papia prohibits people from handling this type of information. So it's not allowed except under specific conditions. And one of those conditions is that special personal information may be handled. And remember, I'm using the term handled as opposed to the technical term in Papia, which is processed because I honestly feel that the simpler term handled covers what processing actually is. So I'll tell you what processing is in Poppy, and I'm gonna take a deep breath. Processing is the collection, receipt, recording, organization, collation, storage, updating or modification. I'll take another breath. Retrieval, alteration, consultation or use of, or dissemination or distributing or making available in any form. Final breath or merging, linking, and erasure or destruction of information. So with that, I feel handling is a nicer term because it's just simpler to understand. And, and one of the exceptions under which special personal information may be handled by you or an organization is if the data subject consents to this. But in my opinion, the more relevant exception to dentists and to healthcare workers is that special personal information concerning a person's health or sex life is not prohibited from being handled by medical professionals, healthcare institutions, or facilities or social services, if it is necessary for the proper treatment and care of the, the subject, that's the patient, or for the administration of the institution or professional practice concerned. So we are collecting this information for those reasons. And that's why I, I tend to say that it's not only consent, there is another so-called get out of jail free card. So that was me answering the first part of my two-part question, which was what is personal information? And now I move on to the second part, which is why does it matter? And this is the part which I think tends to be forgotten about when we get lost in the cold, hard law and the regulations, et cetera. You know, we never really talk about why lawmakers are bothered about it. You know, why is the GDPR so strict about it? Um, why are, do our lawmakers care about this and why are they being so rigid? So I'm not saying the answer is not obvious and don't get me wrong, I'm not here to insult your intelligence. I just think it gets forgotten about when we talk about Papia. And the answer, the simple answer is that personal information is so valuable and in the wrong hands, especially in this hyper-connected online world in which we live, it could destroy lives. So forget about the notions of dignity and rights to privacy and confidentiality for now. Those are all really important, but just park that for now. Your personal information and your patient's personal information in the wrong hands can have devastating effects on your life and on others. And I'll explain just now why I say that your information can have devastating effects on others. But then we also need to remember that Papia goes a step further and says to us that health information is not just any personal information. It's not your run of the mill personal information. And we must ask ourselves, why does Papia make health information so special? Why should it be treated any differently to other personal information such as my name or my email address? So let's just think about it. Right? What information is kept in your patient files? So I've put up you know, some of it there on the puzzle, uh, medical aid information, copies of ID documents, driver's license, prescription information, confidential and intimate information about health conditions. And I can hear somebody thinking, you know, through the screen, okay, Yash, thanks for telling me what I already know. I mean, I know what's in my records, but so what? And, and this is the part where I get to expand on my comment earlier, where I said that your personal information can have devastating effects on your life and on others. So the simple reason, as I said, is that health information is just so valuable, but I don't mean that in some abstract term. I actually mean it literally valuable. So it's some of the most sought after information on the dark web. And the dark web is basically the internet underworld where you can order illicit drugs and hire hitmen. And, and sadly, I'm not joking or exaggerating. That actually can happen on the dark web. 
And on the dark web, patient records reportedly sell for more than twice the price of credit card information. Apparently, they can fetch upward of $1,000 online. Remember, you know, credit cards can be canceled. So once you know they've been misappropriated, you can cancel them. But your health information and the personal information that's in those health records, not so much. You know, they stay relevant for a long time. They don't change much. So besides the dodgy dark web, what else can be done with your health information and the personal information in clinical records? Well, without privacy laws like Poppy and GDPR, potentially these could be sold to insurance companies and that could in some extreme circumstances make you uninsurable. So if, if, if insurers have databases of all your conditions that you wouldn't normally disclose, there is the potential that you, you might be excluded from life insurance, for example. You know, the health records are a treasure trove of information. If someone has access to your medical aid information, for example, they can go, go on, online and order illicit prescriptions under your name. I mean, they don't even need to go online. They can go onto WhatsApp, add the pharmacy onto their WhatsApp and order medication. I mean, I know I've been doing this uh, for my parents during the lockdown, of course, not ordering illicit prescriptions, but their chronic medication. And it's very easy for somebody to have their information and do the wrong thing with it. Then think of the potential for fraud and identity theft, especially these days where we do more of our business online. And I'm not just talking about business transactions or purchases, but even our day jobs. I mean, I interviewed with and I joined MPS all online. You know, what if it really isn't me that they hired? You know, that, that's just a joke. But, but really, what I think is a real life testament to what I'm saying is, is the recent news and and this is going to be ongoing in my opinion, of, of cyber attacks in South Africa. So just last month or, or two ago, a big insurer sent out communication to all its members notifying them of a cyber attack. Uh, then uh, even more recently, there was a big health and fitness company which has gyms all over the country, which fell victim reported in the news. And in 2020, you'll remember there was a big private hospital group here in South Africa. Now think about what type of information all these organizations keep in common. So when the lawyers talk to us about Poppy, it's not just to make us scared so that we can give them our business. You know, this is really happening. And there's a good reason to take the utmost care of this personal information, even if there were no laws like Poppy in place. In my opinion, and in a lot of lawyers' opinion, the law is just catching up with reality. It's always going to lag behind innovation. So that's why personal information matters and why health information is so special. And I really hope we can all appreciate the privileged position we have in society as, as dentists. You know, we are entrusted with the most Im important and intimate information of our patients. And I know that this, this trust has always been there inherent in the social contract, which has been around for centuries. But as you can see, or hopefully see, Papia actually puts that into cold hard law. It, it tells us that being trusted with this information is recognized by privacy law. And it makes sure that patients don't only need to rely on the so-called social contract and the rules of the HPCSA to justifiably protect their personal information. And I really hope that if we come away with one message tonight from me, and if you forget about everything else, the one message I really want you to keep is that we are so privileged and trusted in our position in society, and we must do everything we can to maintain that and not abuse it. So, so just to expose my nerdish side, I, I wanted to share this example of how seriously some organizations take the protection of personal information. I think it's fascinating how thoughtful the designers were in this case. And I'm absolutely sure this was done by design. So on your screen right now is the watch face of my Apple watch while I have it on my wrist. Obviously not now, it's a photo that I took on Saturday the 1st. And, and for those of you who don't know, Apple Watch is a device you wear on your wrist like a normal watch, except, except it, it's, it's not only just a watch, it's also a health and fitness tracker. So those three rings, you might see my mouse now, those three rings in the middle track my movement, my standing time, and my exercise time for the day. And then as the day goes on and progresses, and I hopefully do more of those activities, the ring slowly fills up more and more. And once I achieve my goal, those rings will then close fully. And then in the middle, you'll see a little graph and I've made it on my watch personally um, so that it shows my heart rate for the day. So that graph just shows my heart rate from about midnight. And yes, I sleep with my watch on 
so that it tracks my sleeping pattern. Stop judging me. Uh, so, so that's my heart rate till about 2 p.m. on the day, which is when I took the photo of my watch face. And you can see it was as low as 59 beats per minute while I slept. And, and those of you who know me will know I'm not exactly a fitness fanatic, but I like to have this kind of information at my disposal because it keeps me motivated to avoid a totally sedentary lifestyle with working from home. You know? so, so I can hear what you're thinking, where is he going with this now? Well, those of you who've been paying attention will probably have realized immediately when I, when I put this slide on what this is. This is personal information and it's only for me, for my consumption, except now if I'm sharing it with um, you know, Sada, but that's my choice. And Apple knows this because see what happens the moment I take off my watch. And this is going to be the moment that the watch is not sure if it's in my possession or if it's in some random person's possession, it might've been snatched off my wrist. So this is my watch when it's not sure I actually have it with me. And, and I'm sure you can notice the obvious difference, but just to make it clear, I'm gonna put them side by side. And so you'll clearly see what happens here, right? Um, the, the, the date, time, battery life, and other non-personal graphics um, stays on, right? So on the left is my watch when I have it on, on the right is when I have it off. But look at the heart rate and, and my exercise and move rings. As soon as I take my watch off, they disappear. And I just think again, it's, it's amazing how such tiny detail was thought about. And I just wanted to show you that big companies take such seemingly insignificant personal information so seriously. So, so think about how seriously we as dentists and healthcare professionals should be taking our patients' health and other personal information. You know, we don't just have little colored rings on our, in our notes, we have intimate information. So let's move on then to consent. And you'll remember I said earlier, that uh, special personal information can only be handled if certain conditions are present. And one of those was that the patient consents to that handling or processing as the term is used in Poppy. Now, another condition which I didn't mention is that special personal information can be processed if it is necessary for exercising an obligation in law. And then the obvious next question is, do we as dentists have an obligation in law to process special personal information. And I think if we look at the National Health Act, we'll realize that yes, there is indeed an obligation in other law, which is the National Health Act. So the National Health Act obliges the head of a health establishment, so that's you as the private practice owner, to create and maintain a health record for every patient. Then there's the HPCSA, which talks about record keeping and suggests certain periods for retention of records. So for example, that record should be kept for at least six years from the date on which they become dormant, or in the case of minors for three years after the minor has become a major. So, so in this context, and the fact that Poppy says that health information can be processed in the ordinary course of running your health practice or your dental practice, strictly speaking, in my mind, it's not strictly necessary to rely on consent to justify handling your patient's special inf personal information. But now I'm going to say something totally contradictory, and it's this. Consent is still the gold standard in my view. And, and I feel comfortable saying this because this has been echoed by some of our panel attorneys in recent webinars. The only reason I'm bringing up the fact that consent alone is not strictly necessary is because I'm thinking of this hypothetical academic situation where a patient comes to you or to me and says, I, you know, I adopt Naidu, I don't like you anymore delete all my health records, destroy them. I don't want you to have them at all. And you know, this patient might just be annoyed with me for some reason, I might've given them a difficult extraction or there might be other sinister motives. They might be planning on committing a crime or harming themselves and trying to cover up. I don't know, but the point I'm trying to make is that just as consent may be given, it can easily be taken away. You'll know from previous webinars that we, we, we try to drum in that consent is an ongoing process. It's not a single solitary event, but at least in that unlikely scenario where the patient comes to me and says, destroy my, my records, there would still be some justification for you to keep those records. And because Poppy is so new, the question of consent and whether consent is necessary in this context hasn't been tested by our courts. So this is why I would still say, 
you should get your patient's consent to process their personal information in terms of poppy. And don't just say to yourselves, well, I'm allowed to because other laws oblige me to. So how do you do this? Well, recently, one of our panel attorneys gave some practical advice, which I really think is, is worth repeating because it was good advice, I think. So they say that when you take on new patients, you should get a specific portion of the consent form to deal with the processing of patients' personal information and think about what you're gonna be using that information for, how you're gonna be using it, and then get specific consent for each form of processing. So they say you can use a standard form for that purpose, which you can develop according to the needs of your practice. And what they suggest is that in your new intake forms, you include a special section on POPIA or POPI, which deals with the uh, consent by the patient for all the purposes for which you process their personal information. So this would include treatment, billing, admin of the patient file, debt collection, et cetera. You know, if you're gonna be using uh, photos of your patients on social media, please make very sure you get their consent. Draw this clearly to the intention. Don't just sneak it in. Personally, I think there should be a separate section um, dealing with that. And then another useful tip by our attorneys is it was recently that you can catch up with the backlog of your existing patients who haven't been onboarded with the new process by keeping a register of all your patients. And then as and when they sign the new consent form, they're ticked off as being poppy compliant. So that's just some thoughts uh, on consent and some practical advice from our lawyers. And then lastly, we move on to, does it change everything? And I said earlier on the answer is no. And, and simply that's it, it doesn't change everything. You know, the confidentiality and importance of patients information that we are privileged to deal with has been drummed in over the years by the HPCSA, as well as our lawmakers in the National Health Act. I'm sure Alistair will have been giving this this speech for, for years on end. Um, but there's just now another piece of legislation which confirms this, uh, which is poppy. And all that this piece of legislation does is tell us how to do it properly. But don't get me wrong, this is not to say that you can simply go ahead with your life and ignore poppy. There are some obligations which apply to us as dentists and to anybody who processes personal information, which are not necessarily old knowledge and no old hat, but there's honestly way too much to talk about in any useful detail in 30 minutes. For example, there's the obligation in Poppy to notify breaches of security. So when there are reasonable grounds to believe that your patient's information has been improperly accessed or obtained, accessed or obtained, then you need to notify the information regulator as well as the patient. So it's not just simply a matter of, okay, somebody's stolen my records. I have an obligation to notify. No, even if I have reason to believe that somebody's even looked at those records or somebody's gotten access to my system and seen it for half an hour. Uh, another example of the obligations in Poppy that are not exactly new is the requirement to appoint an information officer. So, so there are many considerations that come with Poppy and it's crucial that you really pay attention to what the lawyers are saying and keep an eye out for dedicated information sessions and webinars and the like by the lawyers, especially when they say it's, it's um, specific to healthcare. And, and usually those will require lots of time to really unpack all the, the nitty gritty of this new law. And I know um, MPS and Dental Protection are giving a seminar on that next week. I think it's a full two hour session dedicated to it. So if you have, have access to it, I encourage you to, to, to log in. But what I wanted to do this evening is, is to let you know, there's no need to panic. If you're doing these things properly from a record keeping perspective, you should be fine. And also remember that the information regulator will probably publish guidelines, hopefully, and codes of conduct of good practice uh, specific to our industry. And, and that hopefully that'll be done soon so we'll have more certainty and clarity. But for now, if you're not sure, you should always make um, sure you can feel free to reach out to your trusted advisors, your lawyers, and, and also attending these types of presentations and just raising your awareness will take you a long way. Um, so I like to end off by just recapping and, and reminding ourselves um, of what the takeaway should be. This will be my last slide. Um, so I hope we all have a better understanding of why personal information actually matters. And its importance is actually the reason behind Popia not the other way around. Uh, and then we spoke about 
the gold standard for permission to handle our patients' personal information and also the reasons why consent is not absolutely the only justification for us. And lastly, not everything really changes, but please be aware of this law. Take advice if you're not sure. And with that, I'll say thanks for listening and I'll hand over to Corbus. I think I'll stop sharing my screen now. Uh, Dr. Naidu, whilst Dr. Barnab is putting up his presentation, maybe deal with one question. And for the attendees, uh, please note that we will take all the questions at the end of the uh, last presentation by Dr. Barnard. There was a question by a doctor, I can't remember, his, I didn't check his name. Um, if my practice PC Casey, which would be stolen, Casey, Casey, all the data of my totally, PC. Casey, you totally broke up there. Uh, maybe, uh, I've lost you for a while. Maybe we should just let Corbus crack on quickly and then we can, I'll try and answer that online and then later on because you broke up completely. No problem. Okay, perfect, yeah. thanks. Thanks. Let's, let's carry on. Sorry about that. Okay, let's carry on. Good evening, colleagues and friends. Uh, thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar. Um, from all over South Africa and in the UK. Uh, thank you for giving up your time after a long and hard work day and giving up whatever you normally do on a Tuesday evening. Can I just first see if everyone can hear me? If, if Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, and you can see my screen, Casey? Yes, we can. Okay, so, I mean, for us as a profession of dentistry, these are undoubtedly challenging times. You know, I've been a dentist in private practice since 1999 in the UK and South Africa. And I can, without doubt, say that the last year has probably been the most challenging for me as a practice owner as a and a dentist. The stringent lockdown restrictions has, has led to a lot of uncertainty and had a devastating effect on our economy. Most of you would know that SADA offers a free and voluntary complaints resolution or mediation service to their members and members of the public who wants to complain about their dental treatment. And it remains a valuable alternative and it has many advantages over complaining to the Health Professional Council, which is the only other free alternative. And in the process, it plays a vital role in containing the rising cost of professional indemnity, which we all know is a bit of a problem for all of us. So in this next 10 minutes, I want to give you a quick update on what's been happening at the SADA Mediation Service, but in particular show you why and how the COVID-19 pandemic has, has led to an increase uh, in the number of patient complaints received at SADA. Let's see if we can. Oh, sorry, I missed that one. Okay, so this graph illustrates the number of complaints received from patients at SADA from February last year until February this year. So the red line represents the monthly average of about 40 complaints per month while the blue line illustrates the actual number of complaints received from patients. So you can note an increase in the number of complaints received from patients from May last year until about November last year. And I want to highlight the main issues that has led to this increase in complaints. This graph also gives you an idea of the value of the service offered by SADA uh, I mean, it'll be interesting to ask someone like Alistair what the cost, uh, the, the actual cost is to a company like Dental Protection to respond to an inquiry uh, to, the, to the Health Professional Council on behalf of one of their members. And I mean, we've, we work with about 500 complaints per year, and that gives you an idea of the value of the service offered by SADA. So the first major issue that has led to an increase in complaints was this issue with PPE. You know, the dental practice and particularly the delivery of procedures involving preparation and cleaning of teeth, which is what we do all day, 
uh, generates an aerosol and is recognized as a high risk for the transmission of PPE. This has led to the introduction of international standard operating procedures focused on infection control to try and reduce the transmission of the virus. So for our patients, this meant that a dentist visit would be quite different from what it used to be. Some procedures would require additional PPE and other protocols, but more importantly, additional costs not necessarily covered by their respective medical aids. Dentists seem to charge anything between 20 rand and 400 rand for PPE per visit, and complaints seem to vary between overcharging and not complying with the guidelines and endangering the public. So if one dentist charged 20 rand for PPE and his colleague around the corner charged 400 rand for PPE, it creates confusion because either one dentist is overcharging or the other dentist, even worse, is not following the guidelines and endangering the public. The other problem with PPE is that we lose our ability to communicate with our patients. So we know from the literature that up to 70% of complaints against doctors can be traced back to poor communication. We also know from the literature that up to 80% of communication uh, is nonverbal. So you try and speak to a dentist using PPE. There's no warm greeting. There's no friendly smile. There's no handshake. There's very limited eye contact. I mean, this quickly leads to increased anxiety, a loss of trust, which increase the risk of complaint. I mean, imagine someone's hard of hearing or, and depend on reading someone's lips. So let's show you two typical cases uh, involving PPE. So the first one, a 60-year-old lady visits a dental practice for some emergency care during level three lockdown. During her visit, not the dentist or the dental assistant wear a mask or a face shield. The elderly lady confronted them and asked them to please wear masks. The dentist jo jokingly said that masks cause brain damage. Of course, the relationship broke down completely and the dentist refused to see her, and she wanted to report this dentist for unethical behavior and endangering the public. The next one is almost too much PP or overcharging. A pharmacist visits his dentist who charges him 342 rand 76 cents for PPE, which, if, which was not covered by his medical aid. This Pharmacist owns a pharmaceutical wholesale business employing 110 people. And he argued that a pair of plastic cover shoes sells at five cents a pair. A disposable hat sells at five cents a pair. A plastic apron sells at 60 cents each, which totals about 70 cents. So for the dentist to charge 342 rands, 70 cents is ridiculous and overcharging. So the dentist responded by saying that Sada has asked every dentist to charge this amount to every patient. This patient went to another dentist who charged him no fee, and he wanted to report this dentist for overcharging. So the next major issue that has contributed to an increase in complaint, complaints is this issue of our current economy. We know the economy will take a long time to recover from this pandemic. We're all in for a rough ride. People are losing their jobs. Others are taking pay cuts. I mean, the current unemployment rate is amongst the highest in the world, I think around 30%. Uh, the economic activity for the entire year in 2020 decreased by 7%. And if you explore the historical data, this is the biggest annual fall in our economic activity since 1946. And to put it in perspective, during the 2008-2009 global financial crisis, the economy shrank 1.5%. So now more than ever, it will be important to be open with our patients about the cost, the cost of their dental treatment. Traditionally, dentists in South Africa have performed poorly when it comes to financial consent or record keeping despite a constant emphasis on the importance of it by indemnifiers, associations, and the regulator. 
let's show you some examples. I, I, I just need to remind you that as professionals, we have a legal, an ethical, and a professional duty to, to make sure that our patients are aware of the cost of their treatment uh, as part of an informed consent process. So let's give you a typical example is uh, a mom takes her 15 year old daughter to the orthodontist in January last year. She accepted the treatment plan and the quotation and agreed to pay in installments. But unfortunately, because of the pandemic, she lost her job and she couldn't afford the monthly installments. She tried to make an arrangement with the orthodontist to pay uh, a small amount, like 100 rand a month, until she could find a new job. But the orthodontist refused to make a review appointment for, for the patient or to remove the braces. Let's show you another example. So a pensioner, Mrs. H, contacted a regular dentist because she had toothache in level three lockdown. The consult During the consultation, the dentist diagnosed an infection in the lower left first molar because the tooth was cracked. She, the, patient, the dentist referred the patient to a maxillofacial surgeon to remove the tooth. Discovery paid 288 rands and 60 cents of a total of 1,193 rands that was claimed. Uh, 905 rands was charged for PPE and after our visit. So this pensioner, despite having a medical aid, had to pay 905 rands for a prescription. That does not even include the medication. The last major issue that has contributed to the increase in, in complaints was this issue of availability. Dentists weren't always available for, for routine and emergency care during, during the lockdown period. Some practices closed down completely, while others only were prepared to offer telephonic consultations. So while telemedicine uh, seem to work really well for other health sectors and will probably be the new normal for a long time. In dentistry, it's had its challenges. Most problems in dentistry requires a procedural approach and the refusal to consult with patients in level three, four and five lockdown has led to a lot of frustration and an increase in complaints. You can imagine that Refusing to see one of your usual patients with an irreversible pulpitis or a, a debonded front crown on a front tooth or a fractured tooth that are razor sharp will challenge any professional relationship, especially if another dentist is willing to see your patient. Let's show you some examples. So Mrs. A contacts a regular dentist with a toothache, the tooth is sensitive to heat, to cold, and there's some spontaneous pain. The receptionist couldn't offer the patient an appointment, but could only offer a telephonic consultation at a cost of 484 rands. The patient was desperate and agreed to pay the consultation fee. The consultation lasted for about two minutes, and she was told that nothing can be done and that she needs to go to hospital. So. Although COVID-19 has brought some new, unique challenges to the profession, the principles of, of preventing and re resolving disputes remain the same as before. The three main predisposing factors, misinformation, misunderstandings about the cost of treatment, and rudeness contributes to the majority of complaints. As dentists, we need to use our common sense and we need to communicate information about current regulations and restrictions, the costs of treatment, including PPE. And we need to do that in an empathic way and try and demonstrate to, to our patients why it's in their best interest to do things the way we do. And if we do the basics right, all these complaints could undoubtedly have been prevented. That's my presentation, Casey. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Dr. Barnard. And um, uh, thank you to Dr. Naidu. Thank you to Dr. McKelvey. I see that whilst we're going through the presentations, um, 
you have been responding. So I'm going to encourage uh, our attendees to please look at the um, questions or answered questions, about 29 of them, and you will find answers there. I'm going to just pick up on some of the uh, questions that still exist. The first question, can you hear me well, everyone? Yes. Perfect. I think the question which I was asking Dr. Naidu, if you can please come back online, Dr. Naidu, um, was a question which you probably have answered, but I think I would like you to verbally answer this one. If I'm a dentist and I keep my patient's detail on a PC and the PC gets stolen, um, the question was, am I still responsible if that data is used for other nefarious uh, reasons, um, it's being sold in the black market, wherever the case may be. Am I still as a dentist responsible? Yes. So Poppy has certain security obligations that it imposes on the responsible party. So you as the dentist are the responsible party processing that personal information. And it requires you to keep certain, to take certain reasonable steps, take proper security measures to lock up your, your records, or if they're on your computer, keep them safely, have antivirus in place, regularly update it, um, not just use something from 2010. So it will all depend on whether you've taken reasonable steps to protect that information. So when your laptop gets stolen, did you go and report it to SAPS? Did you make sure that you had the latest software on your system? It's always going to be a fact-based question. It's, it, I can't answer that as a blanket, yes or no. You need to take reasonable steps to ensure your, your records were kept safe. And depending on what you've done, that will determine whether you're vulnerable or not. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. McKelvey, I know you have answered this one, uh, but I do want you to also verbally answer. What to do? What should the, pay, uh, the dentist do when third party funders request patients record and x-rays? Thank you, Casey. Just just to pick up, do you, do you remember the the UK television program Doctor Who? Did you ever watch Doctor Who? And they have these things called the Dal yes. they have these things called the Daleks on them that used to give me nightmares and keep me awake at night. Well, your sound sounds like you're a Dalek tonight. So there's some problem with your sound, Casey. That's not having an impact on anyone else. But to answer your question. The answer to your question is, if a third party funder asks you to disclose information to them as part of an audit, the best thing to do is to get the patient's permission to release that information. Thank you. I will try to speak slowly um, and see if we can get through this. Um, the other question which I also would like, uh, I think this is Alice that you deal with, uh, which you have answered, should a dentist encounter a complication or an accident related to the treatment, when is the best time to notify dental protection of the situation? Yeah, I, I, I think that, I mean, it's context dependent, okay? But the earlier, the better, because one of the things that we're able to do is we're able to identify problems and come up with solutions before the case develops into something more serious. So we know that patients don't want to litigate, but uh, if they have some unanswered queries, um, sometimes it's a good idea to provide them with an early explanation. Everybody's very nervous about admitting to fault. So um, I would suggest if, if there's any uncertainty about how you manage the incident with the patient, then speak to us first and we'll give you advice on how to handle that situation. Thank you so much. I'm not going to read all the questions since they have been answered and I'm picking on some that I believe uh, we may need to emphasize certain information. This one again, back to Alice there, because I have actually had to deal with these cases a few times. Um, and I think maybe Yesh can come into it as well. With reference to Popia, when a practice is being sold, does every existing patient 
of that particular practice need to be informed and provide consent for the transfer of their records to the new practitioner. I mean, I, I'm going to hand this over to Yash, not that I can't answer the question, but because um, I'm going to give him an opportunity to, to give the guys the answer. So, Yash, what is, what, what is the right thing to do where um, the practice is closing or you're selling it, you've got a bunch of records? How, what, what information do the patients need to know about their records? Yeah, so, so this is less, in my mind, of a poppy question and more of an HPCSA ethical rule and obligation question. So when you're selling your practice, you're supposed to let your patients know, give them ample time to decide themselves whether they want to take their business or their healthcare elsewhere. It's not a, it's not a question of you deciding that you're going to hand over their files to the new doctors. You, sh you should write to your patients, inform them of the situation, tell them, you can tell them who's taking over, give them an opportunity to come and make copies of their records and take it elsewhere. And then you can provide them with those copies at a reasonable photocopying charge if necessary. So not really a poppy question. Yeah, I, I think the key point here is that, it, it, is that the physical record, the actual piece of paper or software that the record is written on belongs to the dentist. But what is the information that's written in the record, the actual contents of the record, actually belongs to the patient. So the file is mine, but the information I've written down about, about your treatment, Casey, that information belongs to you. And therefore, if I'm going to move that information somewhere else to another friend or to, to Dr. Barnard, I've got to have your permission to do that because it's your information I'm transferring. Exactly. And I can see where the person who asked the question might be going because the next logical step might be that what if the patient insists that I transfer the actual physical record to another practitioner? And then it goes back to the point I was making in my talk where I said, well, then you've got a, 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 a justification that you are obliged in law to keep these records for a certain amount of time. So, yeah. I have lost my reception earlier on. Um, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you, Casey. I, I thought maybe one of one, one of the questions that we could discuss is about um, CCTV recordings, because you know everybody's looking for digital solutions to the record keeping conundrum. You know, if you don't have to write a record because it's already being made while yes. you're working and while you're talking to the patient, is is that acceptable? And I think that that the way dentistry is moving, the digitalization of healthcare, I think that there will be a point in time where there are affordable software solutions for dentists to record information, to record conversations with patients and to, 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 to transcribe that into a record that gets stored in the right place. The problem with CCTV images is that you don't require an image to record a conversation, you just require the conversation. And the, the, in, in professional relationships between doctors, dentists and patients, there's this element of trust that we both trust each other, don't we? And, and sometimes that doesn't happen. But the, the fact that you might need to film uh, or record a conversation as a form of defensive dentistry may have an impact on the reciprocal relationship of trust. However, it might, the way that the generations are using digital solutions and people are using their phones, it actually makes sense to me for somebody to develop software that can do this for us and can transcribe it into a record. The problem is, is that if you make a record of a conversation or a film, it becomes part of the treatment record and has to be stored in the same way as the treatment record and has to be disclosed to the patient if they want a copy of it. So you have to take into all of those considerations as well as the poppy requirements of, that, of recording that information and the consent of the patient. So it's a great idea and it's something that I'd like to see before I finally hang up my 
my my my my working career, but I'm not convinced that we've got the right digital solutions yet. Thank you very much. Um, let's carry on. I've got three more questions I want us to maybe touch on. One from Dr. Majasi. She says, by the way, great presentation given by Alistair. Now, Dr. Naidu, retention of physical files with digital. Files are cumbersome, bulky, as time moves into the 10 to 15 years and more. Now, is it necessary to keep is it necessary to keep both? Is it admissible in case of litigation to request a third party like EDI, Electronic Data Interchange Service Provider, um, at least to get data on costing? Yeah, so the second part of the question, I wish I could ask Dr. Majasi you know, a follow-up question, but uh, the second part, I'm not really sure about. The first part I can answer, I think, you know, it's not strictly necessary to keep both hard copies and electronic records, as long as you can keep the electronic copies safely and secure them properly, and they're scanned properly. Uh, you, it's safe to destroy uh, physical copies of records. Um, the second part of the question, I'm not too sure on. And so I don't want to just venture a guess. Yeah. Dr. Majasi, if you would like, you may send us um, or you can send to Alistair uh, or to Yesh, I would say to Alistair, and you can get further clarity. Two more questions. I think this one, uh, Dr. Al um, McKelvey, I would like you to deal with because it speaks to the value of belonging to DP. Does DP ensure your case does not go to court? Or can it go to court with DP as well? In other words, are all costs taken care of by DP if I'm a member of DP? That's how I understand the question. Okay, so the, the circumstances that we would end up going to court would be um, a situation where a patient was suing a dentist and we were defending the dentist and we had uh, a defendable case, okay? So you would, you, you, if, if, if the claim can be defended, then if it means going to court to get a decision, that's what you will do, okay? If you want to appeal a decision of a regulator like the HPCSA, you, you may also have to take it to the court of appeal to get a, to get the decision, so that we will always consider the realistic prospects of succeeding in a case, and we'll always take legal opinion and what are the prospects of a successful outcome here. But if a case is de is defensible, yes. If it needs to go to court, they generally don't go to court because they usually settle because the if we've got a if we've got a case where we can defend the dentist, the patient will realize and they will advise they're wasting their money here and the case will generally settle. But if it has to go to court, then we will pay all the costs that the dentist faces in defending the reputation. But it's, it, it's about, it's shared decision-making. It's about prospects of success. It's about defensibility. It's about legal advice. But that's why you have an indemnity. You have an indemnity with dental protection to protect you from the consequences of paying compensation damages and legal fees. The very last question is on WhatsApp, so social media. I think Dr. Naidu, you will have to deal with this. It is, is it acceptable, sorry. Um, basically the question was uh, the use of WhatsApp, is that is that okay? Because WhatsApp may Yeah, Casey, you broke up. Uh, so is it acceptable? I saw that question. Um, I didn't hear what you said, but I've read it. So yeah. it's it's about the admin of, of reminding pa uh, patients about their appointments. I think it's fine as long as the patients are comfortable with that. Uh, that you see, that might be included in the um, intake form that I was talking about that our panel attorneys uh, advised on to say that we will process your information for the administration of a practice. So once they've, if they're comfortable with that, that's practice admin, and that should be fine, yeah. 
Thank you so much. I want to thank you as the speakers. I want to thank all the attendees. I do apologize. It would seem that my uh, internet has been a little bit uh, not balanced today uh, and not stable, so I do apologize. But if there's any further questions that you want to ask the three esteemed speakers, you're most welcome to send it to Dr. McKelvey, who will send to the relevant people, or you can send to us and we'll send it to Dr. McKelvey, and they will be able to answer you on an individual basis. I want to thank all of the 860 odd attendees tonight and have a lovely night to everyone. And thank you to the speakers for a beautiful presentation, educational as always. Well done and thank you and good night. JC, thank you very much. Thank you to my co-presenters tonight. I, I really can't wait to get back to South Africa. This has really given me the motivation to find a plane that's leaving soon that will get me into South Africa so I can come and see you guys. Um, I, I remember saying to um, Dr. Redlinghuis a few months ago, I said, I can't wait to see you because, because when I do see you face to face, I know we will have both survived the pandemic. So I, 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 I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much for your chairman, chairman's role tonight, Casey, as ever, absolutely brilliant. I can't wait to see you as well. And we'll look forward to Dental Protection doing some more webinars uh, later this year. Thank you very much.